This story begins in a deep and dark forest, where a boy who appears to be a teenager is running for his life. The boy is exhausted and panting heavily, with torn clothes and some wounds that don't seem very deep but provide evidence of the beating he endured while trying to escape. After running for who knows how long, Prince Yo Wun Chen unknowingly arrives at a cliff where he falls, only to find that some men whose faces are covered were apparently waiting for him. The prince, too weak to flee, tells them that they want to kill him, that he had already fulfilled everything he had been asked, neither entering the demonic academy nor studying martial arts. The men tell the prince that it doesn't matter, as despite having peasant blood, he is still the lord's son, so by being part of the lineage he is still capable of obtaining the throne, hence they must eliminate any possibility. Upon hearing them speak ill of his mother and realizing he can't escape anymore, the prince decides to draw a knife he had on him and fight to his last breath. The assassins observe him, wondering if he's trained, but seeing his stance, it's clear he isn't, so they attack the prince. He defends himself with weak and clumsy attacks, only to end up caught by one of the men. When it seemed they were about to kill him, Chen surprises everyone by taking a knife from his back and managing to stab one of the attackers in the neck. The men are surprised to see that the prince had managed to kill one of them, angering the group. One of them quickly jumps on him, disarms him, and throws him to the ground, where he would be impaled with a sword in the stomach. It seemed that the prince would finally be killed, but at that moment, a light appears, killing the one who was about to murder Chen, causing everyone to turn and see the source of the attack, facing a man dressed in clothes from a more modern era, but strange to all present. Without much importance, all these men attack the stranger, who effortlessly kills them all, turning the place into a sea of blood. At that moment, the boy looks at his watch and realizes he's being tracked, so he needs to hurry. He quickly injects something into the prince's body, saying it's a nanomachine, assuring him that it's an upgraded version, and that learning to use it should be easy. Then he tells him he's a descendant from the future, wishes him luck for an easier life, and without much further explanation, disappears at the same speed he appeared. Barely able to breathe, the prince doesn't believe anything the stranger told him as he starts to lose consciousness. Then, surprisingly, the prince hears a voice saying that the seventh generation nano machine is active. Then, we are told how a long time ago, the fighters of Yun learned martial arts to protect themselves from enemies. Over time, martial arts evolved from being a self-defense method to a tool to defeat enemies. They became more sophisticated and complex, as simple forms turned into a series of movements and breathing techniques represented internal energy. Martial artists passed down their teachings and relics to future generations, allowing martial arts to continue evolving. Those who learned martial arts became more powerful than ordinary people and were known as Muram. Fighters aspiring to be disciples were divided into clans, and these clans were split between forces of justice and forces of evil, while another group followed a different path, seeking power alone. The world called them the demonic cult. Returning to the protagonist, after regaining consciousness, Prince Chen wonders how he's alive, as he remembers a sword piercing his stomach. Sweating and with black marks on his body, he senses a terrible smell, which turns out to be coming from him. Then the prince hears a voice that worries him, but he doesn't see anyone around him. He realizes the voice comes from his head and continues asking who it is, eventually receiving a response from the nanomachine, saying it's the seventh generation of Sky Corporation's nanomachines, a technology from the future. Not understanding what the nanomachines are referring to, the prince believes it's an evil god or curse, so to avoid problems, the nanomachines implant information directly into his brain, affecting the protagonist. The nanomachine would tell him that he would get used to it. At that moment, a doctor and another individual, who would be a guard of the prince, were conversing. The guard was recounting to the doctor what he had found upon arriving at the location where the prince was. He was surprised to find the prince in perfect condition, surrounded by blood and just one corpse. Meanwhile, through his thoughts, the prince once again asked the nanomachines who had healed him. However, the machine responded that it had only activated the self-repair mode. Suddenly, the prince felt nauseous and vomited. The nanomachine explained that it was a natural reaction when his brain sent information for the first time, but it wouldn't happen again. It also revealed that nearly 6,482 million and 40,000 nanomachines had been implanted in his body. Surprised, the prince asked if they could be removed, but the machine replied that they could only be removed if he were dead. Determined to hide the existence of the nanomachines, the prince pretended to be asleep when the doctor and his guard entered the room. The doctor examined his pulse and, noticing several anomalies in his body, asked if he had taken any special medicine, as his system seemed completely clean. 
Without suspecting the presence of the nanomachines, the doctor stated that he was fully capable of practicing martial arts in his current state and only prescribed a simple tonic due to his good condition. Once the doctor left, the guard apologized to the prince for not taking care of him, and the prince said he didn't need to apologize. The prince headed to the shower immersed in his thoughts. He began to communicate with the nanomachines about this healing. He decided to test it on himself. He took a knife and cut his hand, observing as his body began to rapidly heal until the wound disappeared completely. After conducting this test, the protagonist, exiting the shower, would notice that his body was now different. This was because the nanomachines had modified his body, making it much more capable and apt. The prince was amazed by his newfound ability to learn and master martial arts. After the shower, the protagonist headed to the library, where with the help of Nano and a new ability that it had just explained to him, analyzing books by simply flipping through them, he felt amazed by the new advantage he had gained. Meanwhile, elsewhere, an individual dressed similarly to those who had attempted to assassinate the protagonist was speaking with their apparent leader. The leader was annoyed by the failure of his men. However, the individual there justified that something or someone had helped, but they had no way of knowing what it was. The leader of these assassins dismissed it and believed he would personally be responsible for eliminating the protagonist. Returning to our protagonist, he was observing his guards training from the window while recalling his mother and the promise she made him on the day of her death, not to practice any martial arts until entering the academy. Meanwhile, Nano offered the protagonist the option to scan the guards' movements, surprising Chen. He hesitated for a moment, considering if this would break his promise. However, he eventually agreed, and Nano swiftly scanned the guards' movements, transferring them to the protagonist's brain. He experienced pain due to the transfer of information but managed to mimic the movements perfectly. However, shortly after, the protagonist began to suffer intense physical pain of unknown origin. Nano explained that although he had the movements in his mind, he lacked the physical capacity to replicate them exactly. Nevertheless, Nano assured him that it was possible to modify his body to achieve this, although the process would be painful and time-consuming. Despite his doubts, the protagonist decided to proceed and asked Nano to continue without applying anesthesia. After a few seconds, the protagonist fell unconscious while Nano continued making improvements to his body. Meanwhile, the guard was preparing the prince's favorite dishes, thinking it would be their last day together. At that moment, he recalled the promise he made to Chen's mother to take care of him until the end. Upon entering the prince's room with the food, he noticed that the prince had lost consciousness and observed marked footprints on the floor which made him suspect that the prince had somehow managed to mimic his sword skill. This seemingly pleased him, and he decided to let the prince rest, leaving the room. After being unconscious for a while, the prince would awaken with his new body, ready to put his new technique into practice. This time, he achieved it again with the same effectiveness, but thanks to his new physical enhancement, he suffered no additional damage. As he looked around, he noticed the impression he left due to the new technique, a strong footprint on the floor. He surprised himself by not having used Nigong, wondering if he had already completed the Weikong, which were the two types of martial arts. Nigong referred to internal martial arts, like breathing or energy manipulation, and Weikong referred to external skills, the more physical martial arts. However, the protagonist wouldn't have more time to think, as the guard arrived with breakfast ready at that moment. This alarmed the prince, who quickly moved a table to cover the mark he had left on the floor before the guard entered. He then observed the breakfast the guard had brought him, his favorite meals, and realized that this might be the last breakfast he would have with guard Zhang. So, quickly and happily, he began to eat the breakfast that had been brought to him. After finishing breakfast, the guard asked the prince when he had learned his dagger technique. This question surprised the protagonist, who for a moment tried to pretend he didn't know what the guard was referring to. However, the guard then moved the table, revealing the footprint the prince had left. Seeing it, the guard realized that it was even more obvious that the prince had used that technique and that it was even better polished than before. The prince thought that stealing techniques from others was a taboo, so the guard might hate him for it now. However, the guard leveled with him and congratulated him for having learned the technique. This surprised the prince, who, overcome with joy that the guard wasn't angry, started crying. After this, a few days passed, and finally, they arrived at the Martial Arts Academy, where all the future students of the Academy were gathered. They were received by the left guard, the Fire King, Li Hwa Myung. He observed these new students with some disdain and saw that right in front were the heirs of the six clans. The heir of the Dark Clan, number one, Chin Mu Yon. As heir of the Sword Clan, number two, Chin Kyung Woon. As heir of the Spring Clan, number three, Chin Mu Kiem. As heir of the Poison Clan, number four, Chin Jong-sum. 
as heir of the Blade Clan, number 5, Chin Yu Chan, and as heir of the Sound Clan, number 6, Chin Wan Raya. Seeing the number 6, he would think it was odd that she was the only female candidate this time. But then he realized that number 7 was missing, and that was the protagonist, who was at the entrance. It turns out that the protagonist hadn't been able to enter because there was no tag with his name. Therefore, he had to wait outside in line like everyone else. Finally, after a long wait, he managed to enter as the last in the line. Inside, all the other candidates teased him since he was the marginalized prince of the lineage. However, the protagonist didn't pay them much mind. Finally, horns would sound, announcing the arrival of the Lord, who would come accompanied by the left guard Siob Meng, and the head guard, Merakiam. The Lord would take his seat, emitting an intimidating aura that made all the candidates unable to even lift their gaze. Then, the order would begin, stating that from now on, all these candidates were responsible for the future of this cult, and they were welcomed. His voice resonated in the minds of all the candidates through Nigong. After this greeting, the Lord would leave, so the left guard would begin explaining how the academy would work. It would last for four years and consist of six stages. After each stage, there would be a test, and they would only have one chance to pass it. This news worried several of the candidates. However, one of the clan heirs raised their hand, saying they had a question, to which the left guard asked who gave them the right to ask a question. This would annoy the heir, however, the guard would tell him that now that he was in the academy, he would lose all the privileges he had as the heir of the clans. This would provoke mockery from all the other heirs. The left guard would say that it was obvious what the heir's question was, and that was because he might think that one chance for the six stages was unfair. However, the special benefit that would be given to those who passed the first stage would be the Black Dragon Ball. It would be explained that it's a medicine that allows the consumer to gain 20 years worth of Nigong value. And the second benefit was access to the secret martial arts books, referring to the Demon Academy's library, which had five floors and every time they passed a test, they would gain access to one of them. However, the guard would also tell them that none of them would even reach the fifth floor. And finally, he would explain that the third benefit was that everyone could attain a new rank never obtained before, as each time they passed the stage, they would gain a warrior rank. Low-ranking warriors for stage 1, mid-ranking warrior for stage 2, high-ranking warrior for stage 3, squad leader for stage 4, and clan leader for stage 5. However, he wouldn't explain the sixth stage, as most of them wouldn't even be able to pass the first three stages, no matter what they did. This talk of ranks would motivate our protagonist, who would think that now survival no longer meant just staying alive but also rising in rank. The left guard would now explain that the talk was over and that the recruits would be grouped into dormitories based on the result of the first test, which was about to begin right now. This statement would worry all the recruits, who would find the idea of having the first test right after starting, without having learned anything or received any lessons, ridiculous. Then, the left guard would explain that in order to enter the academy, a basic level of Nigong was required. This would worry and annoy the protagonist, who would finally understand why he had been forbidden to practice martial arts all these years since if he couldn't enter the academy, it would be easy for everyone else to kill him. While one of the heirs mocked the situation, we would see a woman with an instrument arrive. She was the leader of the Sound Clan, Hang So Yu. Then, the left guard would introduce the leader of the Sound Clan as the one in charge of conducting the first test, causing all the recruits to wonder what kind of test it would be if they needed the leader of the Sound Clan. Then everyone would proceed to cover their ears. The left guard would then say that if the fifth elder played seriously, then no recruit would have any chance. But she would control it, so it might be possible for someone to endure it, even without having Nigong. Then, the leader of the Sound Clan would start playing her musical instrument, spreading a large amount of Nigong energy through the area. This would render several of the recruits unconscious, while others would suffer intense pain. They would complain about still being able to hear it, despite having their ears covered. All of this would be observed by the left guard, who assumed that those from smaller clans would have already fallen, while the six heirs were holding up quite well. Then, one of the heirs would explain that they had been taking medicines since they were young that allowed them to gather a lot of Nigo, which put them in a much more favorable position than the protagonist. But then they would notice that the leader of the Sound Clan was starting to play her instrument more fiercely, and it could be seen that her face was starting to contort, causing even more suffering to the students, while she wondered why he hadn't fallen yet, referring to the protagonist, who was standing without much trouble. He would then see everyone else gradually falling, wondering if they were suffering internal injuries and why he was fine. 
The nano would respond that he was detecting powerful waves of high and low frequency coming from an instrument and that it had left him deaf to prevent him from being affected by these waves attack. While all this was happening, the left guard would think he could sense a feeling of impatience coming from the fifth elder. He would comment that this would be tough for anyone without at least 20 years of Nigong. And he had heard that the protagonist didn't possess any kind of energy, but that must have been wrong, as it was astounding that he could withstand such an attack. Meanwhile, the ears of some recruits would start bleeding, even for those who did have this Nigong capability. Then, one of the heirs would wonder why the fifth elder was being so intense, realizing that her facial expression was distorted. So, trying to guess what it could be, the heir would turn around, which would surprise the other heirs, who would think they weren't supposed to look back. But then, they would all end up turning to see that the protagonist was enduring that attack without much trouble. Realizing that he was being watched by all the people in front, he would have nano-analyzed their facial expressions. He would notice that they all had a mix of emotions including surprise, arrogance, and anger. Analyzing that even if he managed to pass the first test, they wouldn't believe him if he said he had no Nigong. He would ask Nano to give him an internal injury that would make him vomit blood so that he could go unnoticed during this first test. Then, the angry elder, seeing how the protagonist continued to endure, would start intensifying her attack even more. The left guard would notice this, and one of the heirs would start bleeding in the same way as the other recruits. In the end, the left guard would quickly stop the fifth elder, who would abruptly halt her attack. Realizing this, those who had been able to withstand that powerful attack would finally relax, and as everyone watched, the protagonist would be standing firm in front of all the fallen recruits. To everyone's surprise, he would start vomiting a large amount of blood, astonishing everyone present. Seeing how the protagonist kept vomiting blood, the left guard would quickly rush to him to check his condition, thinking that he might be responsible for whatever was happening. Despite not being from the six clans, they couldn't let a member of the Lord's lineage die. At the same time the guard reached him, Nano would say that the protagonist's self-healing process was about to begin. However, our protagonist would stop Nano, almost falling unconscious, being caught by the left guard, who would wonder how much Nigong he had if he was able to endure all that. Analyzing his body, he would be surprised to realize that the protagonist had no kind of energy in his body. He would quickly call some guards from the academy to take the protagonist to the infirmary. Once on the stretcher, having been released by the guard, the protagonist would tell Nano to heal him. Returning to his position, the left guard would scold the fifth elder for what had happened. She would ask what had happened, and the guard would respond that she almost killed the protagonist. Then the fifth elder would ask if that child had some Nigong, and the guard would reply that he had none. And after examining him, he could confirm that he didn't possess any kind of Nigong at all, confirming that he kept his oath. This would anger the elder, who couldn't see how he could endure those energy waves without any kind of Nigong. The left guard would say he had very severe injuries and that he could only endure it thanks to his willpower, while thinking that if he wasn't an illegitimate son of the Lord, he would have liked to raise him as a student. Then, the right guard would join the conversation, saying that the protagonist was something curious. But the left guard would just send him to a corner to drink, starting an argument that would end up releasing a large amount of energy, demonstrating their superiority in power. As the right guard left, he would think that he really liked the protagonist. In the infirmary, the two guards who had the protagonist would have taken him to the doctor of the Demon Academy, Beek Jong Myo. Upon seeing that a patient had finally arrived, the doctor would feel very happy, and with a big smile on his face, he would instruct them to take the patient to the bed. Once there, he would ask what had happened, only to hear that it was an internal injury, thinking that the amount of blood was unusual for an internal injury. Then the doctor would start the examination, while the protagonist would think that he had completely forgotten that he was being taken to the infirmary, and that Nano had practically healed all the damage, thinking that he was in a lot of pain, but that he still had to endure until the doctor finished. As the doctor thought about the odd situation with the protagonist, considering starting acupuncture, a loud thud would sound on the door, startling the doctor. This was the right guard, who would mock the doctor a little. After having a brief conversation with him, the right guard would look at the protagonist, who was unconscious in the bed, just to threaten him, asking why he was pretending to be asleep, proceeding to use his energy to lift him up and telling him that if he didn't wake up right then, he would hit him. So, a bit frustrated, the protagonist would ask him how he knew, which would make the right guard laugh. He would praise the protagonist for his willpower in having managed to pass the test without having any kind of energy. But then he would be interrupted by the doctor, who would tell him that the protagonist wasn't in good condition and that he should receive treatment first. But the right guard would silence him, saying that the adults were talking. 
but then the protagonist would start vomiting blood again. So, the right guard would let him go, allowing the protagonist to lie down again. He would hit his neck with the pillow and while complaining about the pain, the right guard would tell him that he wanted the protagonist to be his student. For a moment, the protagonist would hesitate to accept this offer, so the right guard would start talking about how, by being trapped in the infirmary, all the other recruits would start advancing without him, making him think that he needed someone's help if he didn't want to fall behind. At that moment, he would remember that they had said that those who passed the first test would receive the medicinal ball and access to the first floor of the academy library. Then, the right guard would start laughing, saying that the redhead, referring to the left guard, had forgotten an important detail, and that was that access to the library was only permitted once after passing a test, and the access was limited to a duration of two hours. So, after pondering his own weakness compared to the other recruits, realizing that he didn't possess any martial art learned by his clan, nor Nigong, he would inquire about the paper the right guard had given him, and if it was about the business breathing. The right guard would answer with a smile that yes, and that if he became his disciple, he would teach him this breathing immediately. Despite still having certain doubts, the protagonist would with difficulty get up from the bed, get on his knees, and accept the right guard as his master. And after gaining his new disciple, the guardian would bid farewell to the protagonist and the doctor. Then, the doctor would congratulate the protagonist on becoming the new student of the right guard, and while going to fetch the tools to start acupuncture, the protagonist would think that thanks to the help of this new dwarf master, he now had many more advantages than before. Meanwhile, back with the recruits, they were using meditation to heal the wounds left on them. One of the academy guards would inform the left guard that including Cadet 7 who was taken to the infirmary, the total number of people who passed was 405. This academy guard was the senior superior martial artist Hai Jin Chang. He would think that it was 200 less than the test from 10 years ago, and as expected, the energy waves from the elder were too much, so those who failed would probably find it unfair. Meanwhile, at the gates of the academy, those who failed were complaining, saying that it wasn't fair to fail in that way. As the situation was becoming potentially dangerous due to the recruits not accepting the result, the academy guards would start attacking these former recruits as if they were rebels, easily knocking down and subduing most of them. All of this would be observed by the senior martial artist and the left guard, who would think it was a pity, and the left guard would agree, thinking that if he were in their position, he would also think it was unfair, and they would continue to talk about those who managed to pass, who were exceptional students, and some even passed the test with extreme ease. Among them, the two heirs of the clan stood out the most, the heir of the Dark Clan and the heir of the Blade Clan, who endured these energy waves without moving. Rumors were circulating that the battle for the new lord position would be contested by these two clans. Then, after everyone finished healing their wounds through meditation, the guard would start saying that all those who managed to pass this test would receive a bronze medal to represent the lower ranks of the academy and for the next four years, they would be trained as cadets. Meanwhile, with the protagonist, the doctor was busy performing acupuncture on his body to check his injuries and would tell him that he would have to stay in the infirmary for at least 11 to 15 days before being able to participate in the tests again. Seeing how discouraged the protagonist was, the doctor would say that, even though it wasn't much, he pretended not to know that he was being trained by the right guard. Then the doctor would start his examinations, and thinking about the time the protagonist would have to spend in the infirmary, he pondered the idea of tricking him, with Nano's help, to heal and harm his own body every time the doctor came to check on him, thus successfully deceiving him and continuing training without the doctor suspecting anything. Returning to the cadets, the left guard would begin explaining how the next test would go. For the third test, everyone would take the test simultaneously. To advance to the second stage and become a mid-level warrior, they needed to be familiar with tactics and war strategies. They had a three-week period to prepare for these tests, which seemed very little to the cadets. Then the left guard would ask them if they were curious about why there were only 20 groups. And that was because in the next stage, only 10 groups would pass, meaning the others would be expelled. After the presentation was over, we would see instructor of group 8, Impium, noticing cadet number 3 approaching, wanting to ask him something. Since he was sure he would be the leader of group 8, he would suggest that someone inform cadet 7 about what had happened at today's ceremony, all with the idea of going to the infirmary to kill our protagonist. However, the instructor would grab him by the shoulders and with a smile, tell him it was a very good idea and that it seemed he was grasping the basics of being a group leader. So the instructor would offer to quickly go to the infirmary to inform the protagonist of what had happened. 
The nervous heir, number three, would say he could go himself and that it wasn't necessary to bother. But the instructor would turn angrily, saying that cadets were prohibited from entering the main building. That same night in the infirmary, the instructor would receive the news from the doctor that the protagonist wouldn't be able to return to classes for approximately two weeks. This would be a very bad situation for the instructor, as the tests were in just three weeks, and he wouldn't have time to catch up with the other group members. After some time processing what had just happened, the right guard would arrive in a noisy and surprising manner, ready to start lessons with his disciple. After surprising the guardian with his claim that he had memorized the entire paper, the protagonist would explain that he could only teach during the two weeks the protagonist would be in the infirmary, as during the day he would be teaching at the academy. Having explained that, the right guard would tell the protagonist to sit down and turn his back. Once this was done, the guard would place his hand on the protagonist's back and start channeling his own energy into the protagonist's body, all of which would be scanned by Nano. And as the guard transmitted his energy into the protagonist's body, he would be surprised to see that there were no blockages or obstacles in the energy circulation, thinking that this could be due to the Lord. Meanwhile, in the academy dormitories, one of the heirs would have been beaten up by one of the students, proclaiming himself as the new leader of Group 12. Back with our protagonist, finally, the guard would finish the process of transferring his energy to the protagonist's body, telling him that in a week, he should be able to use business on his own. And with that, they would conclude the training for that day, leaving the protagonist determined to achieve that in just one week. The next day, at the academy's practice field, it would be shown that the new group leaders had been determined. Most of them were the heirs of the clans, but to the surprise of the left guard, the heir of the Poison Clan should have been in Group 12. However, Cadet 18, who had managed to defeat him, was there, earning praise in the left guard's mind for daring to attack the prince. And while the heir of the Poison Clan lamented being humiliated in that way, and received taunts from another heir, he would think of getting revenge on Bikki, the one who had insulted him, by defeating him. That same night, after the training, the instructor of Group 8 would talk to Air Number 3, telling him that regarding Cadet 7, he would have to stay in the infirmary for two weeks and that even if he memorized the theory, the practice would be a problem. Having said that, he would bid farewell to the Air. The Air would then enter the dormitories, kicking the door angrily due to the news he had just received. While shouting and cursing the situation, a loyal member of the clan, Cadet 81 Yahayan, would tell him to calm down and whisper a plan in his ear to take care of the protagonist. Four days later, the doctor would be yawning in the infirmary, complaining that after so much time, he hadn't received any patience. But then a loud knock would come at the door, and as he hurriedly opened it, he would find instructor and young with a cadet behind him who had suffered an attack with a real sword. This would excite the doctor, who would manage to stitch up the wound without much trouble and would tell the instructor that the cadet would need to be hospitalized for three days. That same night, the wounded cadet would get up and, seeing the doctor's equipment, would grab a blade and attempt to attack the sleeping protagonist, trying to cut one of his legs. But he would be quickly electrocuted and rendered unconscious. All of this was due to the protagonist's defense system. A while later, this cadet who had tried to attack the protagonist would wake up tied up and bald. And while the protagonist vaguely explained what had happened, he would show the cadet a mirror. The cadet would start crying and complaining about losing his long hair, which would annoy the protagonist, who would accidentally knock him unconscious again with a blow. Once the bald cadet woke up, he would be gagged, trying to say something, while the protagonist threatened him with a knife before removing the gag from his mouth so he could speak. However, the bald cadet would say he wouldn't tell him anything even if he tortured him, stating that if he dared to stab him, the protagonist would be expelled, as attacking fellow students was prohibited. The protagonist, not giving much importance to what the bald cadet said, would simply gag him again and start rummaging through the infirmary's belongings, from which he would take some needles. The bald cadet would see the macabre smile on the protagonist's face, terrified. The protagonist would take the bald cadet's hands and start pushing the needles into the nails of his fingers. And as he was tortured by the protagonist, he would beg for him to stop in his mind while crying and writhing in pain. This would continue for a while until he finally woke up again after passing out from the torture. The protagonist would say it was the second time he had passed out. The protagonist was about to start again, but the bald cadet would beg him with his head to stop, and the protagonist would proceed to remove the gag. To this, the bald cadet would begin to spill everything, but the protagonist would reveal that he already knew he was Chen Mujiam, and he would reveal that, thanks to the consideration of this heir, the instructor went to the protagonist every day to give him lessons and knew in great detail which group he was in and who else was in the group. 
he would reveal that the one who had come to attack him was Cadet 23 Heobalm. Seeing all the knowledge the protagonist had, he would think that this boy was a monster and they couldn't imagine what he would be like when he became strong. Then, realizing that Bong had no more information to give him, he would use an ability called Jiam Heil to knock him out, making Bong realize that the protagonist did have Nigong and had been deceiving everyone. After this, we would see the right guard running across the roofs of the academy, surprised by the protagonist's abilities. He would remember how the day before, in just five days, the protagonist had already managed to acquire Nigong, exceeding his expectations. In the present, the right guard would arrive with the protagonist and quickly, after greetings, he would ask where he had put something. The protagonist would reply that it was under his bed. From there, he would take out a black dragon ball made by the Demonic Academy with medicinal herbs. This was given to students who were able to pass the first test. If absorbed correctly, it allowed them to acquire 20 years of Nigong after consumption. However, after consuming it, the body becomes resistant, so the effect is less effective in a second dose. Both of them, being near the box, would feel the horrible odor it had. The protagonist's mentor would think that if this boy were able to take that, he would get a maximum of 20 years of Nigong. But then the guard would notice that there was someone in the bed next to him in the infirmary, and upon moving the curtains, he would realize that it was Bong, who was gagged, tied up, and unconscious. Asking if he had done anything to him, the protagonist would reply that he had tried to kill him after Dr. Beak had left, explaining that this cadet had been deliberately stabbed with a real sword to get closer to the protagonist. This would anger the guard, wondering if he didn't know he could be expelled if discovered. He would think that he had guts for not being afraid of that or that he had been sent by someone. And seeing the protagonist's face, he would realize that he already knew who it was. And the protagonist would explain that he was an heir of the royal clan, in the same group as the protagonist. Feeling sorry for the protagonist's situation, he would look at him with a bit of pity and then suddenly hit the head of Cadet 23, explaining that if he pierced his vein with Nigong, it would disappear after just a couple of hours, and that it would take at least 10 years of practice to do it correctly. Then, turning to the Dragon Ball, the protagonist would wonder if he had to consume it by simply swallowing it, but the guard would correct him, saying he had to chew and then swallow to make absorption more effective, despite the horrible smell it emitted. He would be able to chew and swallow it. After that horrible experience, both would take a seat, and the guard would place his hands on the protagonist's back and then start making the energy in the protagonist's body flow more correctly. But in the process, he would realize that the protagonist's body was absorbing all the medicine, and even capable of amplifying it. This would surprise and delight him. After this, the protagonist would look at his own body and realize how Nigong was now flowing through him, being congratulated by his master, telling him that he had been able to acquire 15 times the amount of Nigong which means 30 years, instead of the 20 that was initially said. Hearing this with great enthusiasm, the protagonist would thank the guard. And in his thoughts, he would also thank Nano for his luck. And just as the right guard was about to leave, the protagonist would ask if from the next training session he could be taught his sword skill formation, to which the guard, with a smile, would say yes. Meanwhile, at the academy with the other recruit groups, Air 3 would be happy, unaware that the attack against the protagonist had failed and thinking about how happy that made him, thinking about the suffering of the protagonist, who was looking at the bright future awaiting him thanks to the teachings of the right guard. The next day, we would see the doctor laughing at the guy who had attacked the protagonist the previous night, laughing at the fact that he was bald and looked very ugly without hair, while Bong cursed in his head, realizing that he couldn't even get back at the doctor, complaining about how the protagonist was sleeping peacefully. Then, the doctor would apologize for laughing at Bong and would put the curtain back in place while thinking that it would be better to visit him later. As he left, he would glance at the protagonist, who was sleeping comfortably, and upon looking at him closely, he would think that it seemed as if something had happened last night. But he had no time to waste, as he had to write reports on the treatment of the two patients to send to the administration. Two hours later that same night, in teammates' dormitory, the heir who had ordered the attack on the protagonist would look at someone angrily and demand an explanation for why he hadn't carried out his task. This someone was Bong, who would say that he had stayed up until dawn, and that he had managed to cut the tendons, but unfortunately, someone had stayed in the infirmary all night, preventing him from acting. This explanation the heir would listen to attentively, and after hearing it in anger, the heir would question him if he wasn't making up an excuse just because he had fallen asleep. But Bong would say he was telling the truth and that he had been awake all night. Then, in anger, the heir would shout at him that he couldn't even hit a helpless and severely injured person, 
and would proceed to give Bong a strong kick, knocking him to the ground, which would break a bit. Sitting him on the ground, the heir would start cursing and kicking him. However, amidst the beating, the prince's most loyal henchman would calmly tell the prince to stop, which would anger the prince. But ignoring this anger, this henchman would squat down to ask Bong who the person who had stayed in the infirmary was. Bong would say he didn't remember it very well, but his name was Beek Jong Nyong. The henchman would then say that he thought he had heard that name before, to which the prince was about to say that he didn't care. But the henchman would say that maybe he misunderstood. But in reality, it was possible that the name was Beek Ju Wu, a name that would scare and surprise the prince. It would be explained to us that this Beek was a member of the Poison Clan, the head of the church, and an expert in medicines and poisons. He was also ranked 30th in the Demonic Academy, and if it was really him, it was normal that they couldn't do anything. All of this would anger the prince again, who would curse and start kicking Bong again, asking what sense it had to send that guy to the infirmary, saying that he should forget about being part of his clan. And while he was being beaten and shedding tears, Bong would wonder why, remembering how it was the prince who approached him in the first place, with a friendly smile, asking if he would like to do a little job, and remembering that he asked what would happen if he failed. But the prince told him he had nothing to worry about and that if he agreed to do that job, he would give him his unconditional support to join the main clan, saying he would always keep his word. Back to the present, Bong would be on the ground in tears, cursing his thoughts, saying that the prince had played with him. And after stopping the beating, the prince would crouch down, wondering why Bong had a cloth on his head. And without any warning, he would remove it to see that he had been left bald and his own reflection could be seen on his head, saying he looked like a billiard ball. After seeing this, the prince would renew the kicks, saying that Bong's head was so shiny that he could even see his face. So on the ground, Bong would raise his gaze to see how all his other comrades stayed silent, thinking that all of them would pay for what was happening. Finally getting up, the prince would say he was still in a bad mood, so he would tell his loyal henchman, Jae-hun, to accompany him, to which he would agree without much trouble. And while Bong was on the ground complaining and thinking that someday he would get his revenge on the protagonist, he would ask the doctor if he had ever learned any martial arts. But the doctor, naively, would tell him no, that he had studied medicine, as martial arts seemed boring to him. Later in the infirmary, we would see the protagonist practicing what seemed to be a new technique in front of the right guard. You could see the talent our protagonist had, as the guard had taught him that same technique a few days ago. And although he had made mistakes in those movements and various body postures before, now he could move naturally without making any errors. And the right guard would think that there were no mistakes, and if he kept going like this, he would become a great martial artist. So, he would interrupt the training to move on to the next posture. On his part, the protagonist would think that thanks to Nano, he had been able to perfectly replicate his master's movements. And even though he had to improve, he couldn't do it so quickly as if he did, his master would start suspecting him. Then we would see him perform another new movement with great fluidity, being observed by his master, who would think that he had taught him eight types of movements for a total of 24 postures, and this usually took a long time. The fact that he was able to execute them correctly, and he was thinking that if he had just another two or three months, he could have trained our protagonist even more. Then the master would interrupt the protagonist's training to praise him, telling him that he was a great student and definitely a genius, putting his hands together in reference. The protagonist would say that the right guard was exaggerating. Then the right guard would give a paper to the protagonist, saying that the physical and internal energy flow operating method was written there and that he wanted to be able to teach it to him. But unfortunately, that would be the last available day to train him, so he would tell him not to be lazy, and to train hard, as he expected great things from him, a statement that would somewhat impact the protagonist. The protagonist would then join his hands and bow aloud, saying that he was very grateful for his master's words, to which the master would tell him he shouldn't say that and that he was a good boy. In our point, he would point his hand toward a sword and, using his energy, he would attract it to his hand, pulling the blade out of the hilt, saying that it was his sword Guang Mudo, and he would throw it to the protagonist, who, upon holding it in his hands, would see that it emitted a strange light and was much lighter than he thought. The right guard would take it back to explain that normally, a sword of that type weighs two or three jin, and maybe it was lighter due to being constructed through a special method. And to demonstrate how capable it was, he would pass the blade across one of the stone beds, managing to cut a corner without much effort. And as the protagonist admired the sharpness of the sword, he would wonder why the right guard was showing him all of this. And the master would proudly say that although that sword was light and not very thick, all of that was due to it being made from a special material, so it had nothing to envy from any other sword in the world. 
and getting into position to use that sword, he would tell the protagonist to pay attention, as he was about to show him, saying to look closely and getting into a stance to show the protagonist the technique with his sword. In his thoughts, the protagonist would tell Nano to activate the scan to better analyze his master's technique. The next day, on the rooftops of the academy, we would see the right guard running across them at high speed. On other rooftops at a considerable distance, we would see the central guard and the left guard watching as the little mouse finally came out of the infirmary, referring to the right guard, who was saying that they were turning a blind eye because they were his friends, and that with a violation of the rules like this, he could face severe penalties and would have to repay the favor in the future. And the right guard was explaining how they had arranged everything so that all the guards would watch other buildings and not bother the right guard. The central guard, after observing this for a while, would say that he was leaving then. However, before leaving, the left guard would interrupt him and ask why he was so interested in the seventh prince, meaning the protagonist, and the central guard would say that because after all, the protagonist was a good person. The left guard, while scratching his chin, would say that the central guard was not wrong, as he had always been one to dive headfirst into lost causes. Then the central guard would say he didn't have time to waste, as he had an urgent matter to attend to, and generating a tornado that surrounded him, he would disappear from the eyes of the left guard, who would wonder how he could disappear without leaving a trace, saying he didn't have the nickname God of the Wind for no reason, and it actually suited him quite well. Then, observing the sun, the left guard would prepare to watch how the training teams were doing, Meanwhile, with the doctor, he would be observing the protagonist, saying that normally he wakes up in the mornings, but on that specific day, he was still asleep even though it was quite late. Then, laughing, the doctor would say who knows what he did last night and when he finishes with the paperwork, he would take another look at the protagonist, as at a glance he was resting peacefully. However, what was actually happening was that the protagonist was anesthetized, as Nano was performing the process of muscular remodeling in his body which was already 80% complete, while the joints were at 70%, explaining that it would take another 30 minutes to complete the whole process. 30 minutes later, the doctor was peacefully sleeping at his desk, but suddenly he would hear a scream that would startle him, and he would quickly run to the protagonist's bed asking what had happened, only to find that the protagonist was vomiting next to his bed, which would worry him, and wondering why he was vomiting. He would ask if he was okay while putting his hand on his forehead. Then he would help the protagonist back to bed and seeing that he had finally calmed down, he would put his fingers on his wrist to measure his pulse, realizing that his pulse was too high despite being asleep, saying that it almost feels like his heart is about to burst. But then, suddenly, Nano would initiate the body stabilization process, allowing the protagonist to relax completely, confusing the doctor, who would think that maybe he was just having a nightmare, saying it was time for breakfast. After the doctor left, the protagonist would slowly open his eyes and get up, placing his hand in front of himself and closing his fist tightly to test his new strength, thinking that he now felt incredible and that it was immediately noticeable that his body had undergone a power change, surprised that it had only taken him six hours to go through all of this transformation. Then he would recall the sword technique his master had taught him last time, remembering how at that moment he thought it was an incredible technique and that he could feel the wind pressure even though his master hadn't even used life force, and he would ask Nano if it had scanned everything, to which Nano would respond affirmatively. Then the master, after using his technique, would sheathe the sword and ask the protagonist if he had paid attention, to which he would respond affirmatively. Then the right guard would say that unfortunately he didn't have time to teach him that technique. But in his mind, the protagonist would think that thanks to Nano's help, it should be possible for him to replicate it. And then, he would once again clasp his hands together in bow, thanking his master for everything, who would tell him to take care and train, as from now on, a difficult time awaited him, hoping that he could overcome everything as his student. And as he watched the right guard leave, the protagonist would think that he had never imagined he would be able to find someone in that place who would take an interest in him, and he would say that at least now he knew he had a chance to survive. Then he would ask Nano if the scan was finished, to which Nano would respond affirmatively, saying that the analysis determined that to perform that technique perfectly, he needed to reshape his body in a six-hour process, which would surprise the protagonist who thought it was a long time. So, back to the present, the protagonist would use the technique his master had shown him, managing to use it perfectly, getting ready to move on to the next movement. But then he would realize that someone was walking down the hallway, but the protagonist would be distracted, thinking that this new change had significantly refined his senses. Then the doctor would arrive, brushing his teeth, surprised that the protagonist was awake, and he would ask what he was doing, 
to which, as an excuse, the protagonist would say he was just exercising a little, while being thankful he hadn't been caught. After this, we would see our protagonist put on the Academy uniform and the black number 7 Prince logo on his chest once again. The doctor, with a sigh, seeing how the protagonist put on the uniform, would say he knew the protagonist wanted to get out of there, but he still needed to be patient, to which the protagonist would respond that he believed the doctor would discharge him soon. He would question if he would really do something like that, since he's the doctor and he would get bored without patience. Then, the protagonist would tilt his head, thanking the doctor for everything who would smile and say he didn't have to do that, as he had just fulfilled his duty. And after the protagonist left, with another sigh, the doctor would say that since he didn't have patience, he was going to take a nap. At the door of the infirmary, the protagonist would think that his stay in the infirmary had been very pleasant, as he had been able to secretly learn his master's martial arts, thinking that he would show the right guard that all the time he spent with him wouldn't have been wasted and that he would practice each of the teachings he had received. The next day, on the training field, all the academy students were ready for the second test. Among the crowd, you could hear academy students whispering about a new guy who had arrived, saying there was another one who wanted to be a group leader, confusing another student who was talking to him by saying he had been in the infirmary until now, implying that it was the protagonist who had just arrived. And finally, the heir who was trying to sabotage the protagonist would celebrate that the seventh prince had finally arrived. He would be warmly welcomed by the instructor who with a smile would greet him and ask if he was sure he was okay, to which the protagonist would respond affirmatively. The instructor, with a sigh, would say that he had already explained everything to him in the infirmary, but still asked the protagonist if he was sure he didn't want some kind of checkup, which the protagonist would decline, saying it wasn't necessary, so the instructor, without dwelling on it, would give him a sword and a shield and give the order for all students to take their weapons. The protagonist would calmly walk to his position, but on the way, Chin would talk to him, calling him a worm and saying he had finally come out of his hideout. However, the protagonist would ignore him and keep walking, which would annoy Chin, who would angrily turn to look at the protagonist, who would also turn to look at him with an arrogant gaze, thinking that this heir shouldn't get so excited, as he didn't know the surprises that awaited him. The instructor would begin shouting, saying they were about to start with swords and that this time they would try to be even more careful. He would continue by saying that if an accident happened like last time, the responsible ones would be severely punished. Then, with a red flag, he would start the exam with all the students ready to attack. Then we would hear the thoughts of one of the instructors. This instructor would be thinking that the team leader had a violent temperament, and therefore his subordinates were ready to protect him because they already knew his character. He thought that he hoped they hadn't forgotten the plan to find a safe place. But then this instructor would end up turning his gaze to the protagonist, wondering what he was doing as it almost looked like he was looking around believing he might be too tense. Then, we would start to hear how the instructor began giving orders to his students, telling them to hold their positions and congratulating some for being able to maintain their position and move better than in previous classes. Fifteen minutes later, we would see the pained faces of the academy students who were pushing themselves to be able to follow the instructor's orders. The instructor was complaining to them that they couldn't hold their positions, asking them if that was the best they could do and if they really believed they could pass the second test. And as he thought that these students had very little endurance, he would look at the protagonist again, realizing that he still didn't feel fatigued, wondering what kind of vitamins they had given him since he had been in the infirmary all that time, silently congratulating him on a job well done. Raising the flag, he would give another order for them to change positions. Upon hearing this instruction, the Erchin would tell his companions to form a semicircle and surround the enemy. He would shout, telling them to remember to advance and sink, which these students would manage to do perfectly. And while the protagonist managed to perform these exercises with complete calm, Chin would curse in his thoughts, wondering why they hadn't acted yet and that if they didn't stick to the plan, they shouldn't expect to get away with it. On the side of another student, student one would think that he hoped they remembered when they should act, and that moment was when the position changed. Then, he would exchange glances with Chin and with a smile, he would hear the change in formation which was the phalanx formation, where all the students would stack their shields on top of each other to form a larger shield that would surround them all. Seeing this, the protagonist would think that thanks to the Nano S simulation program, he had no problem following these guidelines, wondering if it had always been this easy. Then, with a new order, the instructor would say to take the swords out of the slots between the shields, an order the students would be able to follow perfectly. The instructor would then shout to be careful and stay compact 
Meanwhile, within the formation, Ya Hyun would smile maliciously, observing the protagonist's rear, thinking that everyone was looking forward, so no one would notice the moment he attacked our protagonist. However, to his surprise, the protagonist would turn to look at him, catching Ya Hyun off guard. But he wouldn't be able to stop, as he would think that it didn't matter because, according to him, the protagonist didn't know any martial arts, so all he had to do was kick him, and that way the protagonist would hurt himself. However, as he got into position and was just a few centimeters from the protagonist's body to deliver a blow, a field of energy force would emanate from the protagonist's body in response to Hyun's kick, sending him flying, surprising everyone present. Lying on the ground, Cadet 23 would be surprised by that reaction, wondering if the protagonist had such a large amount of life force. At that moment, the instructor would arrive, complaining that it was the same thing again, and when he tried to get up, his foot would give him a strong sensation of pain, surprising him and making him look up to see the protagonist, who was maliciously laughing at him. This reaction would anger Cadet 23, annoyed that they were laughing at him, but his thought would be interrupted by the instructor, who would ask him what he was waiting for and order him to return to formation. Frightened, Ya Hyun would try to make up an excuse to the instructor, saying he had a small problem. The instructor wouldn't believe him and would strike him hard with one of his tools. And looking closely, he would realize it was Cadet 23, saying that because he had been slacking off in the infirmary, he would have to do some extra training in the coming days. Cadet 23 was about to complain about the punishment given by the instructor, but the instructor with a terrifying look would tell him he wouldn't tolerate arguing. Cadet 23 would respectfully and fearfully greet him, saying he agreed. Among the students, two of them would mock the situation, saying Cadet 23 was pathetic. Meanwhile, Chung gritted his teeth, thinking about how annoyed he was by the situation that had just happened and the luck the protagonist had to survive that attack. All this situation would be observed by the left guard, who would think that the protagonist had life force energy, and this was something but he had no idea about the things the right guard could have taught the protagonist, thinking they might have used the Wang Dan technique on him to give him life force energy, but he still had too much of it, wondering who had done that as he himself didn't understand, and arriving at the conclusion that possibly the protagonist had an affinity with the Wang Dan technique, but reconsidering, as that wouldn't explain all the life force energy flowing through him, thinking that now there was another candidate to be the leader of this team. Later on at the academy's restaurant, the instructor would give the order that now all students could start eating. They would begin without wasting time, and the protagonist would enjoy the food he was eating, thinking that the chicken melted in his mouth due to how good it was, as he had grown tired of drinking infirmary juice. However, as he glanced around, he would see Chen giving him a murderous look, thinking that guy wouldn't let him enjoy his dinner because he kept glaring at him. Thinking about the fact that he didn't know why he hated him so much, but being from one of the six main clans was reason enough for that hatred. Returning to his dish now even angrier, he would say he bet that heir had good times with his mother while he and his mother had desperately tried to survive. After dinner, the instructor would order that as soon as they finished eating, they should continue and fill out their day's cards. And if one of them didn't do it, the whole team would be expelled. After this announcement, the instructor would take Cadet 23 away, something the protagonist would observe with a mocking smile. Then, all the students would start to disperse, and the protagonist would think that his dormitory matched the team number, so his number was 8. However, in the middle of the way, Leon would interrupt him, saying he didn't have permission to leave, which would annoy the protagonist thinking he wouldn't leave him alone and that he had even brought reinforcements. This situation would be observed by the other students, wondering who was leading Chen Mu Kiam, seeing that it was the pathetic seventh prince, referring to Yon. All this would be observed by the only female among the heirs. On his part, Chen Mu would proudly see how many people had gathered, thinking he would give them a good show. So, he would proceed to stand face to face with the protagonist, insulting him, saying he was just a half-breed and also a coward, asking him why he didn't ask to work in the infirmary so the doctor could protect him forever. However, to all these provocations, the stoic protagonist would only ask Mu if he knew he was speaking ill of a respected person, confusing this heir. The protagonist would respond that he didn't mind being insulted, but he wouldn't let them speak ill of the doctor, surprising Mu, and with a mocking smile, the protagonist would tell Mu that maybe someday he would need his care. Hearing these responses, all the students who had come to watch the situation would start whispering to each other, while Mu would try to justify himself, thinking his intention was to mock the protagonist in front of everyone. 
but he had turned the tables on him. All this would be observed by two more heirs, the only female heir, and heir Chen King, who would think heir Mu was an idiot. Chen, annoyed by what had just happened, would insult the half-breed, saying he was an insect, and grabbing him by the neck, telling him to stop slandering him as he was about to deliver a powerful blow to his face. However, as he spoke, he would be abruptly stopped by another punch to the face from the protagonist making him fall to his knees. And seeing this, the protagonist, with a mocking look, would say that maybe it was he who should keep his mouth shut. For his part, Mu would see drops of blood starting to fall from his nose, and furious at what had just happened, he would ask how he dared to hit him in the face while he observed the blood on his hands. He would then quickly rise to his feet and prepare to deliver a powerful blow with his life force energy to the protagonist. But the protagonist would effortlessly dodge it with an agile jump backward. This would anger Mu even more. But before he could say anything, the protagonist would jump to the roof of the building. Seeing that jump, Mu's lackeys would wonder how he could make such a high jump. However, without paying attention to this, the heir would tell them both not to stand there and to go after him, accepting the order without questioning. And while holding his nose, Mu would think if the protagonist really thought he could escape from him after what he had done. And that as soon as he had him in his hands, he wouldn't even have the strength to make a single sound. Then, after a while of pursuit, we would see the protagonist being chased by Mu's two lackeys, who would wonder how the protagonist could be so fast, cursing and thinking that it wasn't possible. And one of these lackeys would think that the situation didn't make sense, as their distance was always the same. And just as he was about to reach a corner, the air would suddenly appear to pull him out of his thoughts, telling him he was too slow and should run faster, but this lackey would tell him to wait for one minute. However, Mu wouldn't listen to this advice, arrogantly thinking that as soon as he caught the protagonist, his face would become unrecognizable. And with one final leap onto one of the trees, the protagonist would finally stop, being caught up to by Mu's lackeys. And now behind him, Mu would ask the protagonist if he was tired of running. But the protagonist, with a serious look, would turn and say he wasn't running away, but had led him there on purpose, surprising Mu who would see in astonishment how the protagonist approached him with a full force blow ready to attack him, all while explaining that he didn't want too many people to see his abilities, being just inches away from delivering a powerful, life force filled blow to Prince Air Mu's head. However, this blow would be stopped by Mu at the last second, who would manage to block it with both his arms and be pushed back by the force of the blow, and he would think that even though he protected himself, his energy had puzzled him as it was a large amount of life force energy. Angrily, he would ask the protagonist if he wasn't supposed to have any martial arts experience, and he would think that now that he realized the jump he made to escape hadn't been normal. On the other hand, the protagonist would think everything had gone according to plan, and he should seize this opportunity by launching himself at Mu, ready to deliver a powerful blow. At that moment, the lackeys of the prince heir would arrive and see how just then, Mu had narrowly avoided the protagonist's blow, surprising him as well who at that moment, seeing the opportunity, would deliver a powerful counterattack to the protagonist's stomach, who would complain of the pain. But he wouldn't have time to think, as Mu, with a murderous look and a fist wrapped in life force energy, would launch another attack at the protagonist, who would narrowly evade it. But then he would receive a final blow, which would be an elbow strike that the protagonist could barely block, but it would send him flying. Seeing these powerful attacks, the protagonist would think they were terrifying and he could see why it was said that Mu had the skills to become a general. And he would think he was in trouble now that he was running out of life force energy with the Muang Dan technique. And since he had kept attacking, not thinking about the possibility of a counterattack, he would then use a technique that would make him encircle the air, creating a duplicate of himself to distract and confuse him. This he would successfully achieve, and the lackeys would wonder if that wasn't a residual image technique. Wondering if he did indeed know martial arts after all, the protagonist would once again launch a blow towards the air, who would narrowly dodge it to proceed to deliver a strong kick to the protagonist's face, knocking him down. And seeing Yon on the ground, Mu would think he was nothing more than trash, asking him in his mind how he was going to fight against his attack. Meanwhile, on the ground, the protagonist would think about simply avoiding Mu's attack by ignoring his kick, and he would ponder how to counter that technique. Then, Mu, looking down at him on the ground, would tell him he was nothing but a worm and only good for crawling in the dirt. Attempting to get back on his feet, the protagonist would think he had gotten carried away with having life force energy and learning martial arts. He felt invincible thanks to that, so he had underestimated his opponent, realizing there was a big difference between practice and real combat. 
Meanwhile, Mu wondered who had taught martial arts to the protagonist and would launch an attack on him, saying he was going to interrogate him after knocking him out. The protagonist would be worried, thinking that it was the first time he would see that attack. At that moment, he would hear Nano's voice. Nano would say that there were threats from the outside, and to counter them, he would enhance the protagonist's field of vision. Then, he would activate the search for the best style to counter those attacks. Unconsciously, the protagonist would manage to dodge Mu's attack and quickly and precisely deliver a strong blow to his jaw. Both the protagonist and Mu would be surprised by this outcome, and Mu would wonder what kind of martial art that was. Surprised, the protagonist would ask Nano what martial art he was using, to which Nano would respond that in his combat tutorial database, he chose to defend himself using boxing, surprising the protagonist who didn't know what martial art that was. However, Nano would explain that the choice of boxing was derived after calculating the enemy's speed in tenths of a second, and the protagonist would say that as always. He didn't understand, but he was now using that martial art, so he would ask if there were any special moves in this boxing style. Nano would respond that all he needed to do was thoroughly analyze the tutorial. On the other hand, Mu, irritated, would say that this was a strange martial art, realizing that the protagonist still had an ace up his sleeve. He would attack again, saying that his luck had run out. However, before he could launch the attack, Nano would have completed the analysis, and now the protagonist was a boxing expert. He could perfectly see Mu's strikes. Mu would observe in surprise as Yon was now perfectly evading all his attacks, and then he would quickly launch a powerful counterattack. At that moment, he would start having memories of a crying woman. He would remember being told that if he worked hard and impressed his master, his father would return to her, and he wouldn't be with the woman he was with anymore. Then, we would see young Mu listening to the words of a woman who could be his mother, telling him he would have to overcome all obstacles. We would witness another moment where this woman would ask why the emperor had taken her away from his side, even after his wife died, wondering what she had done wrong and why they had turned their backs on her blaming her son Mu for all of this. She would be choking him and blaming him, saying it was all due to his incompetence. Back in the present, he would wonder why all these memories were resurfacing and say that this couldn't be possible, thinking about the fact that he was about to be defeated by Yon. But he would declare to himself that that wouldn't happen, and he would never lose to the protagonist, preparing a powerful life force energy attack. However, he would be abruptly stopped by Jion who would grab his face and smash his head against the ground, knocking him out. On the ground, Mu would start crying, wondering why he had to be defeated by the protagonist. He would say that everything that had happened up until that point was his fault. And that's how the first part of this manhwa ends. If you have reached this part of the video, let me tell you that you have been one of the few people to make it here. So comment the word future in the comments. Remember to subscribe to not miss any videos. With that said, see you in the next video.